Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for another devlog for Dolphin. I'm kicking this episode off at about 2 p.m. on a very overcast Sunday afternoon. A bit later than I usually like to start my devlogs on the weekend, but I will admit to enjoying a very rainy and lazy weekend so far, which is never a bad thing. Anyway, this morning I knocked out some chores, got some exercise in, and I'm ready to buckle down and get back to work on Dolphin. As we often do, we're going to start out with a quick look at the Trello board, which I have to say is looking very clean right now. If we look at the completed milestones on the left and the roadmap here, you might recall that in the last episode we implemented Dauphin's first boss, which was this big, ugly, scary crab thing that can attack the player. Now I think this turned out really well for a first, very rough draft of what a boss encounter might look like, but there was one big glaring problem. The player could attack and defeat the boss, and though the boss could still retaliate and attack the player, the player could not be defeated. And this actually represents a bigger hole in Dauphin's development that I've not addressed yet which is just that the player really doesn't take damage or have a way to be defeated. So in this devlog, we're going to try and tackle that problem. Here in the adjacent column for the milestone, you can see how I've tasked out my proposed solution to this problem, and I'm actually really excited to build out this system. It's not going to be the traditional approach where you have player health that starts out high and lowers down to zero as you take damage from enemies. Instead, the condition of the player is going to be governed by the same corruption system that applies to all other organisms in Dauphin. In the context of gameplay, this means that the player will have his own corruption bar instead of a health bar. You'll ideally want to keep that corruption as low as possible, or hopefully zero, and that corruption level will go up as you take damage and interact with other corrupted organisms in the world. So just as those corrupted crabs from the last episode can spread that corruption between themselves, they can also spread it to the player. I really think this system is going to be a perfect fit for the theme of the game, and apart from that, it should give me some pretty good opportunity to be creative with things like changing the player's attributes or appearance as he becomes more corrupted. Think about uh, Geralt in The Witcher 3, when he has too many potions or decoctions, his toxicity level increases and he starts to change in appearance to look a lot more scary. I think I could do something really cool like that in Dolphin. Alright, I reckon that's enough introduction. Time for me to go heads down now and make some progress on allowing the player to become corrupted. I'll check back in a bit. While I'm working on that, I figured now would be a cool opportunity to show you guys some of the cool enhancements I've made to the game since the end of the last episode. Now, the first of these is kind of small and has to do with combat here. Previously, the only way to trigger aggressive behavior with a corrupted organism is to enter its detection circle, which is invisible, but is basically just a circle that each organism has that can detect the player. Now you can trigger the same aggressive behavior just by hitting any organism with an attack. You can see that after I hit him with that attack, he immediately started chasing the player, and he will stop if you leave that detection circle again. So just a little bit more realistic behavior from corrupted organisms there. The second slightly cooler enhancement was the addition of lights to the cave. So I'll go ahead and jump in the cave here so you can see what I'm talking about. Right off the bat, you'll notice that the cave is a lot darker, and these little mushrooms on the floor are emitting a soft glowing light. Now I'm sure I'll be changing the color and intensity of that light in the future, but this really just gave me an exercise to learn a bit more about Godot's 2D lighting, and I have to say it was really easy to set up, and I'm very pleased with the results so far. The final kind of architectural improvement I made to the game was the addition of scene caching. And what I mean by that is the scenes not necessarily completely resetting themselves each time you load them. A great example of that is the cave, which of course is procedurally generated. The first time you enter this cave now, it will of course procedurally generate its layout and enemies. We'll go ahead and clean up this bat. So now when I leave the cave and re-enter it, we should re-enter that same exact cave with the same layout and the same cleansed enemy. Now this will only persist throughout one game session right now, but this is an important architectural improvement that many scenes will use throughout the game. Hey everyone, it is now Wednesday morning at 6.30 a.m. Still have a lot of work to do on player corruption, but I wanted to give you a quick update since I had to make the decision to change course just a tiny bit. You may recall from the Trello board that my first task was to convert my player class to extend my organism class, and I think this makes a lot of sense conceptually. The player is a human and is an organism, just like the crabs and the bats we've created so far. The first step here, though, was for me to take a closer look at my organism class to make sure that the functionality within actually made sense for the player. And I think it almost does. 
three main responsibilities of the organism class are managing corruption level, dropping loot, which is not quite so applicable to the player, and processing hits from hitboxes, which is what every different attack type uses. That sounds pretty good. Unfortunately, after taking a closer look at some of the logic in these functions, I realized this just not going to be a good fit for the player. For example, my code to handle updates to the corruption level. You can take a quick look at this and see that it's basically centered around the idea that the corruption level should be dropping. If it gets to zero, then we disable all the stuff that makes the organism aggressive and call this kind of virtual cleanse method, which each organism can implement to do something specific when its corruption level hits zero. This is really not at all going to apply to the player because the player wants to have a corruption level of zero and instead that corruption level is going to be going up as he interacts with corrupted organisms. So none of this stuff is really going to make sense for the player. This is kind of true with my collision code as well. All these individual organisms like crabs are expecting to take damage that lower their corruption which you can see in the last line here. But again the player is going to be the opposite when he takes quote unquote damage from one of these organisms, his corruption level is gonna go up. So I'd almost certainly have to override this functionality in the player if I chose to extend the organism class. For this reason, I've decided to keep the player as the player and just give him his own implementation of responding to corruption. And that's what we're looking at here. If I go ahead and head down the beach and find a crab, you'll see that when this guy touches me, the player will start to turn a little bit purple, just kind of like the same corruption color we've been using so far across all the different organisms. Now, if I let this crab continue to hit me here, you'll see that we get quite dark up to a stopping point. And this kind of represents the max corruption threshold for the player, at which point the player will be defeated and probably do something like faint or fall over. Still need to work out what that animation is gonna look like. Now you're probably watching that and wondering why the crabs and other organisms on the beach just looked a little bit different and probably not quite as nice as before. The reason for that is when I was trying to figure out how to apply a corrupted visual to the player, I ended up having to kind of rethink how I was applying corruption to characters in general. The way I've been handling corruption for individual organisms is to basically create two sprites for each one. One sprite will be the uncorrupted or kind of natural version of the organism as you see here, and the other sprite will be the corrupted version, and I used a shader to kind of blend between these based on the percentage of corruption that the organism currently had. I could have easily made this approach work for my little static player here, but I don't think that'll make sense for the long run, because ultimately I want the player to be able to equip different outfits, weapons, gear, and appearances, and it would just not make any sense to create multiple sprites for every single one of those variants. So I had to come up with a way to kind of do this a bit more programmatically. This is where my new corruption shader comes in, which is what you're looking at here. This does almost the same thing as the shader I had before, but instead of blending two images, it just blends a corruption color that I pick in the inspector with the image that we already have. So the result is that I can increase my corruption percentage and this kind of purple color that I've selected will blend in on top of the player. What's kind of cool about this is that the color itself is also configurable for each character that uses the shader. So different characters could potentially show corruption in different ways. I know this doesn't look quite as good as the approach I had before, but this solves the problem of me having to create multiple sprites for each character, which I think is going to be a huge benefit in the long run. The result of this is just that these characters on the beach need a little bit of cleanup. Obviously their shadows should not be affected by the shader, so I need to break those out and make some changes to the coloration of our boss here. Apart from that, I think this is a really good solution and something I'm happy to move forward with, at least for now. All right, I've definitely been talking too long this morning, just after seven o'clock now, and gonna get geared up for a workout. I will catch up with you guys once I make some more progress. Welcome back to Saturday morning and likely the final update of the devlog. 
This week has certainly been a week. I feel like I've been working my tail off just to try and accomplish what I thought was going to be a pretty simple piece of functionality with player defeat. Anyway, I think the effort was worth it. The final product that I finished up yesterday is really cool and I'm excited to show it to you guys. So let's go ahead and jump in. So here we are back on the beach and hopefully you'll notice right off the bat that the horror crab guy is looking a little bit nicer than he was before. I kind of took two approaches to fixing his color. I changed the color of his corruption and also changed the color of his sprite entirely. He used to just look like a big scary purple crab, but you guys suggested in the last episode that defeated bosses should become NPCs, and I really love that idea. So I kind of reworked his coloration to make him look a little bit friendlier when he's not corrupted. All right, now let's take a look at the player defeat sequence, which is what I've been spending all my time on this week. You can see that we're almost near max corruption. The player is very dark purple and has all these corruption particles coming off of him. So hopefully one more attack from the horror crab will do it. Let's go ahead and take a look here. All right, you can see there's a lot going on here right off the bat. So we kind of pause the game, we zoom into the player. The player enters the defeat state where he plays his animation, and now we've loaded an overlay to give us the option to continue or quit the game. Let's go ahead and take a little bit of a deeper dive into this. As you might expect, the player defeat sequence starts with the player. When he reaches his max level of corruption, he will enter his defeat state, which we'll go ahead and jump into here. This is pretty lightweight. It makes a couple preparations for the player to enter that animated sequence that you just saw, and it kind of closes things out by emitting a global signal that the player has been defeated. Now when I say the player is emitting a global signal, what I really mean is that the player is offloading the responsibility of the emission of that signal to a global autoload singleton. And looking at my list of autoloads here, you can see I have a script called Global Signals. There's nothing very fancy about this script, it just emits a signal. But the benefit of doing this is that there are a handful of systems that have to react to the player's defeat, and normally each of those systems would have to have a reference to the player to subscribe to this signal. In this case, it's a lot easier just to have kind of this global bus that all those systems can subscribe to if they want to be notified of the player's defeat. My most important subscriber to the player defeat notification is the World Manager class, which is another autoload singleton. This class is responsible for performing all the transitions between scenes and the scene caching that I was talking about earlier. It also kind of manages any global takeovers of gameplay, things like pausing and this game over state that we're interested in now. So when we receive that notification, we just pause the game using gettree.paused, and then instance our defeat overlay and show that over the player. And this overlay is just the little thing you saw that has the buttons for continue and quit. Nothing too complicated there. As a nice little final touch, you'll notice I made some custom buttons here with hover and click states. Nothing happens when you click continue, but when you click quit, it will take you back to the title scene. So over the past week, we have hooked up the player to our corruption system and enabled his defeat, which kind of takes a big stride towards completing a major gameplay loop in Dauphin. Now I know we still have not created a corruption bar, and I mainly avoided that this week because I realized it wasn't going to be a standalone UI element. It'll be next to whatever resource the player has to spend to cast spells and any UI that revolves around equipping different weapons, so it didn't make sense to design it as a standalone element. I also didn't have time to create any special effects for the player when he's corrupted, and I could really use your help with that. If you have any cool ideas of interesting ways we could change the player's behavior as his corruption level increases, definitely let me know in the comments. I'm thinking of things like increasing his movement speed when he's at a higher level of corruption, maybe even increasing his damage to potentially encourage a riskier playstyle where you run around with a higher level of corruption. In any case, I'm thrilled with the progress we made this week and probably ready at this point to sit down and start editing this video. Thank you guys so much for watching and thanks so much for the support as we crossed the 100,000 subscriber milestone. That's just amazing and I'll have more details in the coming weeks about how I'm going to celebrate that. It's probably going to be with a live stream because a lot of you guys were really excited about that. Anyway, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching and stay safe.